Good morning. Well, it's wonderful to be with you today. I was chatting with uh, our wonderful host, Jim, I believe, and uh, he was sharing with me that uh, he had noticed that you know, a couple of years ago I had come with a fiancé, and now um, the next year after that I came with a wife. Well, we would have brought our dog today, but we weren't <laughs> sure how you felt about uh, dogs and worship. So, um, But it's wonderful to be back here with you. It's wonderful to see... Some, uh, familiar and friendly faces from Trout, and it's, it's just great to be back here with you guys. This kind of feels like uh, a tradition to me, and we're really happy to um, be able to, to be here and worship with you this morning. So thank you so much for welcoming us. Um, I am now serving at a church in Duluth as the senior pastor at a church called Emmanuel Baptist, and it's a really cool name. Uh, it means God with us and uh, is a wonderful thing to remember, especially at this time of year. So it's great to be here with you guys. Uh, We're going to, before we do anything else, we're going to pray, and then we're going to read our scripture passage that we're going to be studying this morning. Please bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word. God, thank you so much for sending us your Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that you could redeem those who were under the law. Lord, not a single one of us is righteous in your sight um, under your law. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But Lord, you've given us a gift of righteousness in Christ Jesus uh, so that we can, we can live before you. We can have a relationship with you. We can have peace. Uh, peace that passes understanding. Lord, we just thank you so much for this word. Uh, we thank you for people like Anna, the prophetess who, who shared the gospel with others. And we pray that you would use this passage to help us to examine our own hearts and, and see how we can take her example. We thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, please open your Bibles to... Luke chapter 2, verse 36. We're going to be studying the next four verses. I'm using your pew Bible here. It's page 1499. (laughs) That helps. All right. Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 40. Now there was one Anna a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Well, Gabriel, the heavenly host, the Magi, the star of Bethlehem, Simeon, and an 84-year-old widow. What do they all have in common? They were all messengers of Christmas. Now we often see decorations in people's yards at this time of year. We see wise men, we see shepherds, we see angels, we even see stars. But how many of you have ever seen an inflatable old woman in somebody's yard. (laughs) Well, I haven't either. But maybe we should, because she was an important part of this story. This part of the Christmas story happens about 40 days after Jesus' birth. And uh, in obedience to the law, Mary and Joseph brought their firstborn son to the temple to the court of women and uh, to do two things. 
Uh, first, uh, there was a, uh, an offering of their son to God, and there was a, a redemption. And this goes back to the story of the Exodus. And so that was very important. God knew that his son would be in the temple. You kind of think about God planning this before uh, creation and how there was going to be this temple in Jerusalem. His son was going to go there in remembrance of his great deliverance of his people, Israel and Egypt. And that was the, the great foreshadowing of salvation. And now his son, who is God's salvation, would fulfill that type. Um, and there was that awesome connection, him going to the temple with his parents. And just as God uh, had this way of redeeming the firstborn sons and they remembered God's salvation, so his son would participate in that. So it's a really cool connection there. Uh, also, Mary had to undergo uh, purification. So God, this is all part of God's plan that they're there in the temple. And at that moment, uh, two people uh, were there. There was Simeon and there was Anna. Now, we're, looking, we're focusing here on Anna. And she was such an important example to us. Because not only did she receive Christ's good news herself, she told others about him. Simeon knew that he wasn't going to die until he had seen the Messiah. He knew from biblical prophecy that he was getting really close to that ballpark. But the Holy Spirit had told him, Simeon, you are not going to see death until you see the Messiah. And so he was listening. He was waiting. And the Holy Spirit said, okay. Well, this is a paraphrase. But the Holy Spirit sent him into the temple. Go, get going. This is the moment. <laughs> and he saw this baby. And he knew that this baby was God's salvation. This was the salvation that God had promised. Now, um, we're told here in this text that, that Anna came at that same moment that Simeon was there. She too had felt this nudge from the Lord. And she uh, overheard uh, this whole conversation that Simeon had with his parents in which Simeon gave his prophecy that, that this child would be destined for the fall and rising of many. He would be, to those who rejected him, their fall because... God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. But if anybody rejects that salvation, they condemn themselves. And He would also be the right for the rising of many. Everyone who put their faith and trust in Him would not only be lifted up to enjoy this wonderful salvation, but would also literally participate in His resurrection. Well, I'm sure everyone has heard a sermon before where they were encouraged to share the good news. Let's just do a quick show of hands. Have you ever heard a message about how important it is to share the gospel? Okay. That's about as many hands. I, I expected uh, that many hands there. I'm sure this isn't your first rodeo here. Uh, the thing I find unique about this story is that Anna had so much in common with so many congregations, right? Um, here she was, an aged woman, a widow, who yet was very active. And she, we, we hear that she shared the good news with everyone who was seeking redemption in Jerusalem. And we see here that she did not share the good news out of guilt. Oh, uh, you know, the pastor said we really should be sharing. And it's really, uh, really bugging me. No, it's, she didn't share out of guilt, but we were told after she had given thanks. And that is, that is the key here. She blessed God for this wonderful gift of redemption. And out of that spirit of joy and thanks, she shared the gospel with others who were looking for redemption too. And she's an example to us for those very reasons. Now, sharing the gospel is not easy for many people, Right? Yet too often we count ourselves out of the race before it even begins by talking ourselves out of it. How many of you, when you were in school or are in school and maybe you have a track meet or maybe you had a big speech coming up and right before you were thinking, oh man, why am I even here? You know, 
I, I just feel so nervous. Uh, I, I can find something better to do at home. I, I'm just going to leave. Um, we, as human beings, we oftentimes count ourselves out before it even begins. We talk ourselves out of it. Well, I want to share a story with you. And nerd alert, I'm going to share a little bit about myself. When I was about 14, 15 years old, my parents sent me to apologetics camp. Now, uh, obviously, the main reason they did this was so that I would gain in social popularity. And <laughs> they knew that if I went to apologetics camp, I would become you know, way cooler. Uh, my social cachet would just shoot up. Um, no, but I went to this apologetics camp, uh, a ministry called Worldview Academy, and while we were there, we learned all sorts of amazing things about uh, the biblical worldview and what these key truths that God wants us to know and understand, how they tie in with our life. Uh, it's not enough. It, the, the Lord doesn't just want us to act a certain way. He wants us to believe. He wants us to trust Him, to build our lives off of foundational truths. And so, uh, going to this academy, part of it, the big thing at the end of the week that we knew was that we were going to go to Como Zoo in St. Paul and we were just going to meet strangers and we were going to share the gospel with them. Whoa, I, I was pretty nervous about that. I'm 14, 15. This is the period of time where my voice is regularly cracking and I'm going to go meet strangers and talk to them. Well, um, they, they prepared us. We kind of were trained in this Ray Comfort sort of uh, evangelism where we would share the Ten Commandments with them and then ask, you know, have you ever, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever um, had a lustful thought? Have you ever, um, you know, this? And you kind of go down a, a round of questions and people, if they're being honest, will say yes, yes, yes. And then we talk about how, well, you know, the, the penalty for all of these sins is, is uh, eternal separation from God. But God doesn't want you to be lost from Him. He wants you to know His love. And that's why He's given the Son, Jesus, so that if you believe in Him, His uh, death on the cross covers your sins and you can be right with Him and en enjoy eternal life with Him forever. And so that's kind of the spiel. Now imagine me in a much... Uh, a much uh, more nervous fashion, my voice cracking, sharing that. We walked up to two teenagers uh, who were a couple of years older than us, so you can imagine how, how intimidating that felt. And we walked up to them, and uh, a couple of us, and, and I remember sharing this message with them. And to my complete surprise at the end of this terrible job of conveying it, one of the, one of the teenagers said, yeah, I'd love to pray with you right now and receive that. What? <laughs> I, I expected you to stone me or something. Well, there, it just goes to show that you know it's not about us. Our voice can crack. We can be nervous. It's, it's not about a, a method. It's not about um, being suave or anything. It's about the Lord working through us. And if we allow the Lord to have that opportunity in us, we will see amazing things. Uh, we'll see a great reward. Uh, what more of everlasting reward could be ours than sharing the gospel with somebody? What greater living legacy than to have another voice join the heavenly chorus in praise to God for this amazing salvation? Yet in our fallen human nature, we discourage ourselves from tasting this reward, Right? Uh, how easy it would have been for Anna to do so. Now she could have said, I'm too old. Who'd listen to an old woman like me? She could have said, I serve God by praying and fasting. I'm in the temple every day and every night. Shouldn't that be enough? She could have said those things. She could have said any number of things. But remember, uh, if we look in the passage uh, before, Simeon tells us that Christ is the one who reveals the thoughts of the hearts. As she saw this infant king who would bring salvation, her heart was revealed to be one of thankfulness for this gift. And she let it flow out in sharing the good news with others. 
Now, one thing I love about the Bible is the details that God decided to include in the story. If we go to John chapter 21, um, this is right after the disciples are trying to kind of figure out what's going on in their lives. This is after the Passion Week. Christ is resurrected. And um, they, they know that he's resurrected. They're not quite sure. You know, you kind of get the sense when you read it that they're going back to something familiar. Fishing. They know this. Um, to kind of sort out a whole bunch of issues in their lives. John twenty one eleven, And Christ shows himself to them uh, by first appearing as a stranger. They're fishing. They're not catching anything. And the stranger on the shore says, you know, cast your net on the right side of the boat. And all of a sudden, they just get this huge fish. And Peter and John are like, it's the Lord. (laughs) I mean, how else would this happen? Um, And when they catch so, uh, so many fish that the net... Um, is full of them, they can't even bring it back into the boat. They have to drag it back to shore in the boat. Wouldn't that be great? And this is what I'm getting to. We're told that there were exactly 153 fish in that net. I just love that because those details encourage our belief in Scripture's authenticity. You can tell that that was written by fishermen, right? Right? A fisherman is going to include, yes, there were exactly 153 fish. He had to like really, really you know, restrain himself to not go into more detail there, but he wanted us to know that there were exactly 153. Well, the detail I notice here in the story of Anna is that she is 84 years old. How many people in the Bible uh, do we not know how old they were when certain things happened? You know, we kind of think that Mary was probably younger, um, and oftentimes she's portrayed as a teenager. But we're not told how old she was. We're not told how old Joseph was in the story. They're pretty big characters. But we don't get those details. This lady who only occupies a couple of verses in this chapter in the entire Bible, we're told she's 84. Now, why is that detail there? We know that she had been married for seven years until she lost her husband. Now, perhaps many might look at Anna and think that she had been dealt a rough hand in life. Here, she had been married uh, for only seven years, and then uh, she spent the rest of her life uh, serving God through prayer and fasting in the temple. Maybe some people thought, oh, you know, she's had a rough life. But I don't think Anna thought that way. I think she wanted to serve God in whatever way she could. I think that she served God out of, not that she didn't have anything better to do, but out of this great thankfulness to the Lord and her spirit for all that he had done for her. These details help us to appreciate even more the loving, obedient spirit within her. Now, we certainly do want to imitate her, but how? Well, Let's think about some of those pesky thoughts that swarm around our heads when we're thinking about sharing the gospel and that kind of discourage us, kind of tend to keep our jaw closed. Um, Let's think of those as like mosquitoes. And now we've taken out this bug lamp and we're zapping them, okay? We're zapping those pesky thoughts. Now what do we do? Well, remember Anna shared after she had given thanks. The answer lies in first giving thanks to God. Jesus taught that those who have been forgiven much will love much. Now remember, when you first uh, heard the gospel and and the Lord convicted you of your sin and your need for a Savior, can you remember that awesome feeling of just how good it felt to know that God had forgiven you? To know that God loves you? To know that that, uh, you get to spend an eternity with Him? That no matter how tough things are at any one point in time, that God's not going to stop loving you. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Now, saying all those things, what feeling comes into you when you think about that? Maybe just a really, really bare, surfacey way to describe that all is thankfulness. Um, 
Remember that first love to God, how he met you in your rebellion and loved you with an everlasting love. Remember that graciousness to you. And as you treasure those things in your hearts, you're going to have that spirit of thankfulness. And when you are really thankful for something, what happens? Well, you tell people about it, right? Um, you know, this happens all the time. You know, uh, your car stops working and they get it done a little faster than you thought it would, a little cheaper than you thought it would. What happens? Well, hey, you know, you got to check out this auto body shop. You know, they, they really took care of me, you know. Um, it's, it's really as simple as that. When, when we think it's, um, when we're thankful, it just kind of flows out of us. Then out of that thankfulness, keep your eyes peeled. Anna spoke of Christ to all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Now remember at this point, Christ is still a baby. And Anna, when she shared the good news, what, did she, what was she saying? Maybe people thought she was crazy. But she was saying, look, God's Messiah is here. He's a baby, but he's going to grow up and he's going to accomplish what God sent him to do. And that was enough. We know a lot more of the story. The Messiah had been promised to them as God with us, and now we have him with us. They knew a redemption was coming, but they didn't yet see how all those grand and glorious promises fit together in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the gospel that we have is so rich and so full, but yet it's something that a child can understand. And uh, many of us have come to the Lord as children. And, it, and we know the story of Jesus. Well, the key is that we share that story. We who know so much more may find it easier to explain the gospel as an accomplished fact rather than as a still unfolding hope. But the hope that the accomplished fact gives us is no less hopeful. This child, Emmanuel, was named Jesus, which means Redeemer or Savior, because uh, he would be, excuse me, a savior who would save his people from their sins. Excuse me. Uh, Romans 3.23 reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You and I are all in the same boat. We're all in need of a Savior. We all need that. Our Lord Jesus Christ taught in John 3.16-18, through 18, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Jesus can save us from God's just judgment that we deserve by taking our sins upon Himself at the cross. And in this way, God shows His love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is the blood of Christ that draws us near. There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. A redemption involves taking back something that belongs to you, often by paying a price. Christ paid the price for your sins, so that if you believe in him, it will be just as if you've never sinned and he's taken you back. Or perhaps there's no Christmas lawn ornament on your yard of an 84-year-old woman. But let these verses remind you at this season that you too can be a messenger of Christmas to all those seeking redemption. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful story of Anna. We thank you for the genuine thankfulness that flowed out of her. God, it, we all get nerves at times. And... Uh, we don't like that feeling. But Lord, please help us not to talk ourselves out of sharing good news with people. Help us to just let it flow out of us. Help us to nurture that thankful spirit that says, Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. I want to tell others about it. God, we, we love you so much. We do offer uh, this day and the, the new year before us to you and pray that you would use us to serve you. Lord, that might look uh, very humble. It might look uh, 
Well, it might look a lot of different ways, as many different ways as there are people in this church. But God, we, we do offer ourselves to you as, um, as obedient sons and daughters who are excited to see what you can do through us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, uh, God bless you as you go about the rest of your day. Uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and uh, God bless you and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day.